My dear brothers and sisters, it's an honor to be asked to participate in the Sperry Symposium to, uh, on this occasion, of course, uh, study the Book of Mormon, but to annually pay tribute to a great Latter-day Saint scholar and a wonderful Christian, Brother Sidney B. Sperry. And I'm, I count it a real privilege to be associated with BYU, with religious education, and to be with you today. I've been asked to address a subject that, uh, that seems so very fundamental, and it is, but it has such profound implications, and that is the doctrine of faith. So I hope you'll limber your fingers and get your scriptures ready, and we'll do some scripture searching today. And, uh, and maybe before we're done, we'll be able to understand or feel a little more about the doctrine of faith than before we started. I want to begin with two scriptures that I find particularly sobering from the Book of Mormon. If you would go first with me to the Book of Moroni, to chapter 7. The prophet Mormon has spoken about a number of things, faith and hope, and he will soon speak about charity. He has spoken about the ministering of angels. I'd like to go to verse... 33 of chapter 7. Now I say it's sobering. Pay attention to the kind of implicit warning contained in these verses. Verse 33. And Christ hath said, If ye will have faith in me, ye shall have power to do whatsoever thing is expedient in me. And he hath said, Repent, all ye ends of the earth, and come unto me, and be baptized in my name, and have faith in me, that ye may be saved. And now, my beloved brethren, if this be the case, that these things are true, which I have spoken unto you, and God will show unto you with power and great glory at the last day that they are true, and if they are true, has the day of miracles ceased? Or have angels ceased to appear unto the children of men? Or has he withheld the power of the Holy Ghost from them? Or will he, so long as time shall last, or the earth shall stand, or there shall be one man upon the face thereof to be saved? Behold, I say unto you, Nay, for it is by faith that miracles are wrought, and it is by faith that angels appear and minister unto men. Wherefore, if these things have ceased, woe be unto the children of men, for it is because of unbelief, and all is vain. For no man can be saved, according to the words of Christ, save they shall have faith in his name. Wherefore, if these things have ceased, then has faith ceased also. And awful is the state of man, for they are as though there had been no redemption made. Well, that's a scripture, a scriptural passage that uh, essentially charges us to ask not only of our day and our world, but of, of our personal lives to what extent we enjoy the gifts and wonders and miracles that God has ordained to be the common lot of the faithful. Go with me to one more passage to, to uh, begin, 2 Nephi chapter 9. This is a passage I had uh, read starting in verse 21. I had read many times, but I had never read until a few years ago, uh, and it sobered me. 2 Nephi 9, verse 21, as you know, this is Jacob's great testimony of the atonement and the resurrection. 2 Nephi 9, 21. And he cometh into the world, Christ that is, that he may save all men if they will hearken unto his voice. For behold, he suffereth the pains of all men, yea, the pains of every living creature, both men, women, and children, who belong to the family of Adam. And he suffereth this, that the resurrection might pass upon all men, that all might stand before him at the great and judgment day. And this is the verse that is particularly sobering to me. And he commandeth all men that they must repent 
and be baptized in his name, having perfect faith in the Holy One of Israel, or they cannot be saved in the kingdom of God. Perfect faith, or they cannot be saved. Now, I don't know how that strikes you, but it gets my attention at least. Perfect faith. Who do you know that has perfect faith? Well, perhaps before we're done today, we can have an appreciation for how we can approximate that perfect faith. Let's begin then by asking a series of questions and try to answer them along the way. Question number one, what is faith? I suppose most Latter-day Saints, and for that matter most Christians, are prone to, to offer the definition given of faith by the Apostle Paul when he explain to the Hebrews that faith is the substance or the assurance, as the Joseph Smith translation has it. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. To that definition, if you will, we add this one from Alma. And now, as I said concerning faith, faith is not to have a perfect knowledge of things, Therefore, if ye have faith, ye hope for things which are not seen, which are true. Now, putting those two together, if we, just, if we just started there, putting those two scriptural passages together, let's talk about the elements of faith. There is a need for evidence. It was Elder Orson Pratt who, years ago, made the comment that uh, all faith, true or false, is based upon evidence. And thus, the greater the amount of evidence, the greater the faith. It seems to me there are two kinds of evidence we could talk about. There's evidence that is of a, an external nature, and there's evidence that is internal. External evidence, for example, for the existence of God would be of the kind that uh, that uh, Alma makes reference to in the Book of Mormon. You recall that when uh, Korihor demands a sign and Alma says, you have had signs enough, and then goes on to say, you have the scriptures before you, you have the words of the prophets before you, you have the words of your fathers before you, and not only that, you have all things as a testimony, and he describes the nature and order of the cosmos, the orderly system in the cosmos, how they all testify of a divine creator, uh, a kind of external evidence, a, a cosmological proof, if you will, for the existence of God. Uh, the Doctrine and Covenants, the 88th section, makes reference to the fact that whoever has looked upon the stars and the planets and the heavens come to, come to see God moving in his majesty among his handiwork. This represents a sort of external evidence. Internal evidence is of a different kind. President Brigham Young, uh, speaking of this internal kind of evidence, said, speaking of how he came to know of the truthfulness of the restored gospel, President Brigham Young, if all the tact, talent, wisdom, and refinement of the world had been sent to me with the Book of Mormon and had declared in the most exalted of earthly eloquence the truth of it, un undertaking to prove it by learning and worldly wisdom, they would have been to me like the smoke which arises only to vanish away. But when I saw a man without eloquence or talents for public speaking, who could only say, I know by the power of the Holy Ghost that the Book of Mormon is true, that Joseph Smith is a prophet of the Lord, the Holy Ghost proceeding from that individual illuminated my understanding, and light, glory, and immortality were before me. I was encircled by them filled with them, and I knew for myself that the testimony of the man was true. But the wisdom of the world, I say again, is like smoke, like the fog of the night that disappears before the rays of the luminary of day, or like the hoarfrost in the warmth of the sun's rays. My own judgment, natural endowments, and education bowed to this simple but mighty testimony. Now that's an internal evidence of which we speak an evidence that plants itself upon the human soul. Elder Orson Pratt uh, described it this way. He said, the gift of the Holy Ghost 
was given to me. And when it was shed forth upon me, it gave, a test, gave me a testimony concerning the truth of this work that no man can ever take from me. It is impossible for me, so long as I have reasoning faculties and powers of mind, to doubt the testimony I then received as among the first evidences that were given, and that too by the gift and power of the Holy Ghost. And while I'm speaking upon the subject, Elder Pratt says, let me say that the gift and power of the Holy Ghost given to an individual is the greatest evidence that he can receive concerning God, godliness, and the kingdom of heaven set up upon the earth. There is no evidence equal to it. You'll notice the other word that's used. Notice as we bring together both Hebrews 11 and Alma chapter 32, verse 21, in, in determining the elements of faith. The other word that's used, interestingly, is the word hope. Faith and hope are so intricately arranged. They are so closely tied, it's almost impossible to tease them apart. When we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have hope in Christ. To have faith in Christ is to have hope in Christ. That hope, like faith, is a process. It isn't really accurate to say, well, this person has no faith because he doesn't have this or that. Really what we're talking about is a process of faith. A person begins here and he moves along the continuum of faith until he has faith unto life and salvation. And so it is with hope. A person might begin with just a hope, as the Zoramites had, or were encouraged to have, that there is a Savior. Just a hope that there might be a Savior. Have no more than a desire to believe, to use the words of Alma. But that once that faith in Christ came to them, there would come a higher level, a grander level of hope, which manifests itself in my mind in three things, all related. Assurance, anticipation, expectation. When the prophet Mormon said, what is it that you shall hope for? He went on to say, we hope for a resurrection unto eternal life. It's one thing to begin with a hope that there is a Savior. It is another thing to progress to that point where we have the assurance, the anticipation, the expectation of dwelling with that Savior everlastingly. Notice that putting those definitions together, we frequently deal with the unseen. We have faith in that which we cannot see. Um, go to Alma chapter 5, if you will. There's a phrase that's used in the Book of Mormon uh, that I really am fascinated by. Alma chapter 5, verse 15. Let's go ahead and read 14, since that's a famous verse. Less famous is 15. This great chapter uh, on, the re on spiritual rebirth, Alma 5, verse 14. And now behold, I ask of you, my brethren of the church, have ye spiritually been born of God? Have ye received his image in your countenances? Have ye experienced this mighty change in your hearts? Now, I place that emphasis where I do because that's essentially what I think what he's asking. He's described the former day saints. He's described those who have come unto Christ, who've had a rebirth, because of the things that were taught them in their day. And his question is, have you been changed? Now verse 15, do ye exercise faith in the redemption of him who created you? And then notice, do you look forward with an eye of faith and view this mortal body raised in immortality, this corruption raised in incorruption, to stand before God to be judged according to the deeds which have been done in the mortal body? Eye of faith, eye of faith. In speaking of, of people in the Book of Mormon who exercised faith, listen to this now. There were many whose faith was so exceedingly strong, even before Christ came, who could not be kept from within the veil, but truly saw with their eyes the things which they had beheld previously with an eye of faith, and they were glad. You know, we often speak of the pre-mortal life this way. We say, well, in that world we walked by sight, but in this world we walk by faith. Well, the fact of the matter is, in that world we walk by sight and we walked by faith. And in this life we walk by faith. 
In this life we walk with an eye of faith until we truly see with our eyes the things which we had only previously seen with an eye of faith. When the hope that we had is fully realized. Faith in the unseen. Notice that another element of those definitions, faith is exercised only in that which is true. That which is true. Uh, the prophet Joseph Smith, you'll recall, in the lectures on faith, suggests to us that uh, before any rational and intelligent being can exercise faith unto life and salvation, three things are required. The idea that God actually exists, a correct idea of his character, perfections, and attributes, and third, an actual knowledge that the course in life he is pursuing is pleasing to God. A correct idea. President uh, N. Eldon Tanner at the April 1978 conference made reference to the fact that uh, when the first uh, American settlers came to this country, they found the Native Americans and uh, began to trade and uh, enter into some negotiations with them. And uh, some of the Americans convinced the Native Americans that uh, if they would uh, trade with them the things they wanted, they would give to them gunpowder. And they encouraged them to plant and nurture that gunpowder, which they did, in the hopes that they would grow weapons. Well, they planted it, they fertilized it, they worked with it, they watered it, they cared for it, and they gave it all the sincerity they could, but of course nothing grew. Why? Because the seed was false. We cannot exercise saving faith, faith unto life and salvation, faith of which the Book of Mormon speaks, except in something which is true. You and I can spend our days worshiping a cedar post, or a crocodile, and we can give all our devotion and all our sincerity to that being, and in the end we're entitled to all the things that a cedar post and a crocodile can give unto us in the world to come. It was the prophet Joseph Smith who taught us, building upon what Paul says in Hebrews 11, that faith is a principle of power. Faith is not just a quiet, quiet belief. Faith is a principle of power. When Jesus says, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you could cause this tree to be cast up or, or mighty miracles to be wrought. What is he describing? He's describing a power. And the power described, for example, in the 12th chapter of Ether. By faith, so-and-so did this. By faith, so-and-so did that. By faith, Alma and Amulek were released from prison. By faith, the brother of Jared commanded, and the mountain Zirin was removed, and so on. We're describing here a power. These are all elements of what faith is. Now, question. Next question. Why is faith needed? Why is faith needed? Well, when the great prophet, preacher, missionary Aaron was teaching the father of Lamoni, he followed a pattern that all of the great Nephite teachers used, and that is he began to search and teach from the scripture and teach the plan of salvation. He taught the creation. He taught the fall. He taught the atonement. And then there was added this line in the, in the 22nd chapter of Alma. And since man had fallen, he could not merit anything of himself. One of the harsh realities that we discover in the Book of Mormon, one that I, I believe it's important that we do discover, is the reality of the fall. And the Book of Mormon makes that very clear from very early on, from the 10th chapter of 1 Nephi throughout the book, we're introduced to the doctrine of the fall. You recall it was President Benson who said, just as a man does not really desire food until he's hungry, so he does not desire the salvation of Christ until he knows why he needs Christ. And no one really knows why he needs Christ, he said, unless and until he understands the doctrine of the fall and its effect upon all mankind. And no other book in all the world, Brother Vincent said, teaches that quite so well, as does the Book of Mormon. And so, one of the reasons why faith, because we're in a condition, brothers and sisters, where we cannot save ourselves. We're in a condition where our merits are not sufficient to save us. Because man had fallen, he could not merit anything of himself. 
Thus, our only way of being saved, because we cannot save ourselves, is to rely upon, trust in, lean on, have confidence in someone who did live the law of God perfectly. Because we fall short, our trust in, reliance upon, confidence in, those are all synonyms, must be in a greater. That's the essence of faith. How does faith come? Well, you recall it was the Apostle Paul who said that faith comes by hearing the Word of God. The, the prophet Joseph Smith took that and elaborated a little bit, and he said that uh, faith comes by hearing the Word of God through the testimony of the servants of God, and that testimony is always accompanied by the spirit of prophecy and of revelation. Let me read something from the prophet Joseph Smith that I think is really a great statement about how faith comes. From the Lectures on Faith, Lecture 2, paragraph 56. We've now clearly set forth how it is and how it was that God became an object of faith for rational beings and also upon what foundation the testimony was based which excited the inquiry and diligent search of the ancient saints to seek after and obtain a knowledge of the glory of God. And we have seen that it was human testimony and human testimony only that excited this inquiry in the first instance in their minds. It was the credence they gave to the testimony of their fathers. This testimony having aroused their minds to inquire after the knowledge of God. The inquiry frequently terminated, indeed always terminated, when rightly pursued, listen to this language, in the most glorious discoveries and eternal certainty. Lecture 2, paragraph 56. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Let me show you a passage that I think is easily passed over. Go with me to Helaman, chapter 15. Notice here from Samuel the Lamanite something that uh, we miss. We, 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 we pay such close attention, and we should, to the signs of Christ's birth and death in the teachings of Samuel the Lamanite that we miss some of the other more subtle but powerful teachings. Helaman 15, look at verse 7. Starting verse 7, Helaman 15, And behold, ye do know of yourselves, for ye have witnessed it, that as many of them as are brought to the knowledge of the truth and to know of the wicked and abominable traditions of their fathers, and are led to believe the Holy Scriptures, yea, the prophecies of the Holy Prophets which are written, which leadeth them to faith on the Lord and unto repentance, which faith and repentance bringeth a change of heart unto them. Therefore, as many as have come to this, ye know of yourselves, are firm and steadfast in the faith and in the thing wherewith they have been made free. Now think about what that's saying, brothers and sisters. The power of the Word of God, as given in the Holy Scripture, leads to faith. Why? Because in the Scripture we come to discover, one, that there is a God. Two, and this is very important, what God is like. His powers, His attributes, His character, His, his characteristics what he is like. The more I study the scripture, the more I come away knowing of a God who is all-powerful, who has all might, who has all knowledge. Therefore, a God in whom I can trust implicitly. Were it not the case that I had full and complete confidence in him, I could not exercise faith in him. I mean, it'd be kind of a tragic thing for me to get down and ask the Lord a difficult uh, question and to hear back essentially, well, my goodness, I've never heard anything like that. Uh, let me check with someone. Uh, it, it's hard to exercise faith in a being who is not in a position to have all knowledge. It is hard to exercise faith in a being who does not have all power or all mercy or whose love does not qualify and perfect all of his other virtues. And so, the scriptures open to my mind who it is we worship and why we worship him. And the more I immerse myself in the language and the logic and the power of scripture, the more I find myself feeling a deep reverence and adoration, the proper fear of God that I, I must have 
in order to exercise true and saving faith in him. How does faith come? It comes by believing, by believing. And I just want to say something about that. It's very interesting to me that, uh, that uh, early, early in the Book of Mormon, and I'll just make quick reference to this, early in the Book of Mormon, we're introduced to this thought. Nephi says, I, Nephi, being exceedingly young, nevertheless being large in stature, and also having great desires to know of the mysteries of God, wherefore I did cry unto the Lord, and behold, he did visit me, and did soften my heart. Now, I think most of us would suppose that he had a pretty soft heart to begin with, but notice, did soften my heart, that I did believe all the words which had been spoken by my father. Wherefore, I did not rebel against him like unto my brothers. And I spake unto Sam, making known unto him the things which the Lord had manifested unto me by his Holy Spirit. And it came to pass that he believed in my words. Dear brothers and sisters, in a day of great cynicism, in a day of tremendous skepticism, thank your God for the privilege that you have and the tendency that you may have to have a believing heart. Because this, to me, is fundamental to faith. The capacity to believe, the capacity to have my heart softened like Nephi and like Sam. You see, you contrast that with a group of people. That was from the, the second chapter of 1 Nephi. But you contrast that with a group of people, years after King Benjamin, who are described as follows. It came to pass that there were many of the rising generation that could not understand the words of King Benjamin, being little children at the time he spake unto his people. And they did not believe the tradition of their fathers. They did not believe what had been said concerning the resurrection of the dead, neither did they believe concerning the coming of Christ. And now because of their unbelief, get this, they could not understand the word of God, and their hearts were hardened. And they would not be baptized, neither would they join the church, and they were a separate people as to their faith. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm moved by this line. It's a haunting line. Because of their unbelief, they could not understand the Word of God. That's Mosiah chapter 26. There, there are some things, my dear brothers and sisters, that a cynical man or woman will never know. There are some things that a skeptical man and woman will never know and they will never understand. I remember hearing Elder Gene Cook years ago drawing upon the words of the poet when he said, when a person comes to a study of the Book of Mormon, when a person comes to ascertain whether the Book of Mormon is truly the Word of God, it's a real accident if he or she approaches the book like this, well, I'm going to get it and prove it false. It's a real accident if they gain a testimony. He said, there must be a willful suspension of disbelief. There must at least be on the part of the reader the attitude of, I wonder, could it be? Now, you see, it's not unimportant to me, and this is certainly not unrelated, that of all the spiritual gifts listed in the modern revelations in section 46, the first is the gift of testimony. To some it is given to know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he was crucified for the sins of the world. And the next, to others it is given to believe on their words, that they also might have eternal life if they continue faithful. The gift of believing, the gift of a believing heart. We open ourselves to great faith, to saving faith, to marvelous faith, through humbling ourselves and believing. Question, how does one act by faith then? If I could be very plain and practical, I would say one acts by faith when he or she is faithful, dependable, loyal, righteous. What does it mean for a, a young missionary, for example, to exercise great faith. As we'll show a little more in, in a few moments, it isn't just a matter of having the power of positive thinking in their lives. 
First and foremost, that missionary exercises faith when he or she is true to the mission standards, when they live the mission rules, when they work hard, when they throw themselves into the work, when they pray and study and search and labor. How does one act by faith? When they're willing to proceed without full knowledge. When they're willing to proceed without full knowledge. And the Book of Mormon, like the other books of Scripture, teach us a great lesson. We come to know as we do. Isn't that what Jesus said? My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. What does the Book of Mormon teach? You receive no witness until when? After the trial of your faith. Being willing to proceed without full knowledge. How does Nephi proceed? I was led by the Spirit, not knowing beforehand the things which I should do. There was that quiet confidence, that faith in his heart, in the Savior, in the Lord, thus he could proceed. Knowing as he knew the power of God to bring to pass his own purposes. How, do, how does one act by faith? As he or she acts according to the will of God, the promptings of the Spirit. Many years ago, I had just been home from a mission a short time when late one uh, Saturday evening, my parents and I were watching uh, some television. It was a warm summer evening in Louisiana. The telephone rang and uh, on the other end was a very frantic mother talking with my father on the phone. She pleaded for him to come quickly to the hospital. Her son, 16-year-old, a good friend of my younger sister, had just collapsed on the softball field and was dying of a strange degenerative nerve disease. In only a matter of moments, he had, he had uh, contracted this somehow and his life hung in the balance. And so dad said to me, come with me and I'll explain on the way. So we jumped in the car and on the way over he told me what he knew. They wanted a blessing. We rushed up to the fifth floor, opened the doors, only to find that we were too late, that the young man had passed away. We tried to console the people as much as we could and then finally made our way home. We came in the back door and my sister who met us and said, how is he? My dad said he passed away. My sister's first comment, quick as a snap, was, why didn't you raise him from the dead? And then with all of the maturity and experience and profound knowledge that I had as a young returned missionary, knowing the answer to all things, uh, I said to my dad, uh, yeah, why didn't we raise him from the dead? <laughs> and he taught a great lesson when he said, because the Spirit of the Lord didn't tell us to, that's why. You see, it wasn't a matter of us charging into the hospital room and raising him from the dead. That isn't faith. It wasn't a matter of us saying, get out of our way, we're going to work a mighty miracle. That isn't faith. Dad knew clearly when to and when not to. Now at the time, I have to admit, there crossed my mind the sneaking suspicion that that was a kind of a spiritual cop-out. But as the years passed, I came to learn some things about my father. I watched him act by faith, and I had learned something interesting before too long, that he had been with his father on one occasion, when a call had come, when they arrived, when a young person had been dead for two or three hours, when my grandfather thus laid his hands upon their head, called them back from dead, raised them from the dead. Dad knew when to and when, knew when not to. And so acting by faith isn't just acting in a positive manner. It isn't just, I'm going to act and wish, 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 and hope, hope, hope it comes to pass. It isn't just willing something to be. Acting by faith is acting according to the will of God. It is coming to know the will of God. Years ago, President Harold B. Lee 
speaking here at BYU made reference to the fact that learning by faith is a strenuous effort. It requires, he said, the bending of the whole soul. Now that's a graphic way, my brothers and sisters, of describing, I believe, what is required for you and me to come to know the will of the Lord. I want you to know that I have the confidence and the faith in the Lord that if he wants me to move Mount Tempanogos to Utah Lake, I can do it. The more difficult thing is coming to know that that's what he wants done. You see, for me the effort is not the command to move. The effort, the strenuous effort, the bending of the whole soul is trying to get my own will out of the way, get my own thoughts out of the way, and open myself to his mind and will. Acting by faith is acting according to the will of God. Some time ago in A New Witness for the Articles of Faith, Elder Bruce R. McConkie said the following. What he was doing was, was responding to what the Prophet Joseph had said in the lectures on faith. The Prophet said, what does it mean when we say that a man acts by faith? And the Prophet answers, we say that when a man acts by faith, he acts according to the power, he acts by mental exertion rather than physical force. He acts by words. And then Elder McConkie spoke on that, commentaried on that. He said, working by faith is not the mere speaking of a few well-chosen words. Anyone with the power of speech could have commanded the rotting corpse of Lazarus to come forth, but only one whose power was greater than death could bring again to life the brother of Mary and Martha. Nor is working by faith merely a mental desire, however strong that some eventuality should occur. There may be those whose mental powers and thought processes are greater than any of the saints, but only persons who are in tune with the infinite can exercise the spiritual forces and powers that come from him. Those who work by faith must first have faith. No one can use a power that he does not possess, and the faith or power must be gained by obedience to those laws upon which its receipt is predicated. And then, now notice this part, and then when the day is at hand and the hour has arrived for a miracle to be wrought, then they must be in tune with the Holy Spirit of God. He who is the author of faith, he whose power faith is, he whose works are the embodiment of justice and judgment and wisdom and all good things, even he must approve the use of his power in the case at hand. Faith cannot be exercised contrary to the order of heaven or contrary to the will and purposes of him whose power it is. Men work by faith when they are in tune with the Spirit and when what they seek to do by mental exertion and by the spoken word is the mind and will of the Lord. That's from A New Witness for the Articles of Faith, pages 191-192. Question, what then does it mean to work Excuse me, what then does it mean to exercise faith in Christ? As I've thought through this a great deal, it seems to me, my dear brothers and sisters, that faith is the complete trust, confidence in, reliance upon the merits and mercy and grace of Jesus Christ for salvation. This must be what Jacob meant when he referred to having perfect faith in the Holy One of Israel. That first couple of scriptures I read, the one about if miracles have ceased, it's because of the unbelief or lack of faith. And that other scripture, only those who have perfect faith in the Holy One of Israel. I really am persuaded that that refers to only those who have learned to rely wholly, to use Nephi's language, to rely alone, to use Moroni's language upon the powers of the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have to do our part. We do, because the gospel is indeed a gospel covenant. We promise to do what we can do. We promise to have faith in the Lord. We promise to repent of our sins. We covenant to be baptized and to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. We covenant to strive all our days to keep in harmony with the covenants we've made. To live, to live a life befitting a follower of the Savior. On his part, he agrees to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. We cannot forgive our own sins. We cannot change our own heart. 
We cannot make ourselves into new creatures. We cannot raise ourselves from the dead. We cannot establish ourselves in a kingdom of glory. He alone, who is God, can do such a thing. That is the nature of the gospel covenant. So for me, again, faith is the complete trust, confidence in, reliance upon the merits and mercy of Jesus Christ for salvation. Final question. What are the fruits of faith? Well, scattered throughout the Book of Mormon are those marvelous passages which teach us that the fruits of faith are such things as hope, forgiveness of sins, peace of conscience, joy, wholeness, patience, deliverance, new life in Christ. What are the fruits of faith? Spiritual gifts, signs, wonders, miracles, the ministry of angels in our lives. What is the fruit of faith? The greatest and grandest of them all is eternal life. Turn with me to Alma chapter 32, if you will. What is perhaps best known as, a, as the great passage on faith, Alma 32. Alma 32, verse 41. Alma 32, 41. But if ye will nourish the word, yea, nourish the tree as it beginneth to grow, by your faith, with great diligence and with patience, looking forward to the fruit thereof, that is, the great fruit of eternal life, it will take root. And behold, it shall be a tree springing up unto everlasting life. And because of your diligence, notice how this next verse put, seems to put it all together for us. Because of your diligence and your faith and your patience with the word in nourishing it, that it may take root in you, behold, by and by ye shall pluck the fruit thereof, which is most precious, which is sweet above all that is sweet, and which is white above all that is white, yea, and pure above all that is pure, even as the Savior is and ye shall feast upon this fruit even until you are filled, that ye hunger not, neither shall ye thirst. There, then, my brethren, ye shall reap the rewards of your faith and your diligence and patience and long-suffering, waiting for the tree to bring forth fruit unto you. In that same New Witness for the Articles of Faith, Elder McConkie said the following, God the Father is an eternal being, the very name of the kind of life he lives is eternal life. And thus eternal life consists in living and being as he is. In other words, eternal life is to gain the power of God, which power is faith, and thus to be able to do what he does and to live as he lives. And the great and eternal plan of salvation that he has ordained and established consists of those laws, ordinances, and powers whereby faith is acquired and perfected until it is possessed in the same degree and to the same extent that it exists in deity. Faith will thus dwell at that day independently in every person who gains eternal life. That's page 169. Well, the prophet Joseph, in speaking of faith and the fruits of faith, taught the following. When men begin to live by faith, they begin to draw near to God. And when faith is perfected, they are like him. And because he is saved, they are saved also. For they will be in the same situation he is in, because they have come to him. And when he appears, they shall be like him, for they will see him as he is. Then he goes on to say this. These with a multitude of other scriptures, he just quoted a bunch of scriptures, which might be quoted, plainly set forth the light in which the Savior, as well as the former day saints, viewed the plan of salvation. Notice how the plan of salvation is described by the prophet. That it was a system of faith 
It begins with faith and continues by faith. And every blessing which is obtained in relation to it is the effect of faith, whether it pertains to this life or that which is to come. To this, all the revelations of God bear witness. I feel a great surge of gratitude for the revelations of the Restoration, particularly the Book of Mormon. The Bible chronicles acts of faith and deeds of wonder in both the Old and New Testaments, and there are a few places where the principle of faith is discussed, to be sure. But it's to the Book of Mormon that we turn if we're serious about gaining faith like the ancients. In the Book of Mormon, we have restored to us, first of all, the knowledge of the God of miracles, the God of revelation, the God of the ancients. Having established these fundamental truths, all other doctrinal matters are then revealed in their pristine purity and fitted into place in the grand scheme of restoration. We learn from the Book of Mormon what faith is, the object upon which it rests, and the fruits that flow from it. The Book of Mormon is not just a book about faith. It is a book that describes the process of faith, illustrates that process, and invites us by the power of the Holy Ghost to be active participants first in the acquisition of faith unto life and salvation, and second, in the dissemination and perpetuation of that faith throughout the earth. God be praised for the marvelous book that has come to our day, that we may hold it up as a beacon, that our witness of the Book of Mormon, and particularly of its testimony of the need for faith in our lives, might be near and dear to each one of us, and that we might stand as competent witnesses of the Lord and exercise that faith that will one day lead to life eternal is my prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.